Chapter 6, Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Balance. Now, you guys, this is a really, really important chapter, and I recommend that you get your book. If you could see my book, it is highlighted up the wazoo. It has yellow and green and pink and orange. So many important things in this chapter for us to understand in order to take care of our patients and be sure that their safety is paramount in our care. So let's just begin um, with the very first statement on chapter six. It says, maintaining the correct amount and distribution of body fluids and electrolytes and the correct pH of body fluids is essential for survival. Survival, we've got to keep our patients surviving, right? Um, the body constantly makes adjustments to maintain this balance. That's one thing that's so great about our body. We have positive, negative. We have a teeter-totter effect where we are constantly keeping our body in homeostasis or balance unless there's disease and, and that affects that balance. But we want to do the best we can taking care of that. So nurses must understand the basic principles of fluid and electrolyte and acid-base balance to maintain homeostasis and to detect and correct imbalances. So we need to be there on the front lines, finding and recognizing these signs and symptoms that could point to a problem for our patients. And then we can report them to the doctor and get those taken care of. So let's talk about homeostasis first. Very, very important. So homeostasis, oh, starting on page 82. So 50 to 60% of our body is composed of water. And the tendency to maintain relatively constant conditions as in the fluid compartment is called homeostasis. All the organs and structures of the body are involved in the maintenance of homeostasis or balance. Homeostasis is necessary for cells to be able to carry out their work. Body fluids are in constant motion, maintaining healthy living conditions for body cells. The process of homeostasis involves the delivery of essential elements such as oxygen and glucose to the cells and removal of waste, such as carbon dioxide. When the body does not maintain homeostasis, the cells cannot function properly and illness or death results. Now, I hope you're with me. That was right under homeostasis on page 82. So I'm gonna be going uh, into the book a lot. I've tried to give you the page numbers where I am. I'm also gonna be reading from the book a lot because there's so much information here. So let's talk about body fluid compartments. Body fluid compartments. So body fluids are classified as intracellular and extracellular. Important to remember, intracellular in the cell is fluid within a cell. An extracellular is fluid outside the cell. Most of the body's fluids are found within the cell. Extracellular fluids are found in the blood vessels in the form of plasma or serum called intravascular fluids. In the fluids surrounding the cells called interstitial fluids include lymph fluid and elsewhere such as in digestive secretions, sweat and cerebral spinal fluid. Now, this is important to know that extracellular fluid is mainly responsible for the transport of nutrients and waste throughout the body. So extracellular fluid outside the cell carries nutrients and waste throughout the body. All right, so now we have the water. So water, as I said before, 50, 60, 50 to 60 percent of our body weight. Women have a lower percentage of body water than do men, and obese people have a relatively lower percentage of body water 
they have more fat cells. Uh, then there's solutes. In addition to water, body fluids contain solutes, and that's something that's dissolved in the water, such as electrolytes and non-electrolytes. So as I was saying, water is the largest portion of body weight, and it's affected by age. The elderly have less water, so their skin turgor is poor. They're usually more on the dehydrated side. Sex, females tend to have more water. And as I said, uh, obese body fat contains less water. So here's just an example of water. What does water do for us anyway? Well, it regulates body temperature when we sweat we can cool off our body, so that's fluid loss, right? Uh, protects the body organs and tissues. It helps prevent constipation, so we need to drink a lot of fluids to prevent constipation. It helps dissolve minerals and other nutrients to make them accessible to the body. It moistens tissues, such as those in the mouth, eyes, and nose. It helps to lubricate joints, it lessens the burden on the kidneys and liver by flushing out waste products, so drink a lot of water. And it also carries nutrients and oxygen to the cells. So that's how important water is and what it can do for you. So drink a lot of water. So let's talk about electrolytes now. I'm on page 83. I haven't made much progress, have I? Because it's very intensive, isn't it? very intense. So electrolytes. So what is an electrolyte? Well, it has an electrical charge when dissolved in water. When these substances are dissolved in water, they break up into small particles called ions. So ions is an electrical charge. Now, if they're positive, that's a cation. And I kind of think of that like, well, I like cats. So cats are very positive to me. So a cat ion, I kind of remember it that way. Um, I'll give you my hints, but you may have some hints of your own of how you remember things. And, you, and also I want you to remember that with electrolytes, a positive always goes with a negative. So like sodium chloride, that's a positive and a negative. Potassium chloride, positive and a negative. So always remember there's a positive and a negative that balances out or keeps homeostasis. So a negative charge, a negative charge uh, electrolyte is called an anion. And those uh, that are shown here are chloride and calcium. Bicarb is also um, a negative charge and phosphate as well. So electrolytes maintain a balance between positive and negative charge. So for every positive, there's a negative. In every fluid compartment, they constantly are balancing each other. And this process keeps the body in homeostasis balance. So let's talk about a few of these electrolytes. Well, I went to the next slide, didn't I? But let's talk about some of these lights because you're looking at your book now, right? So page 83. So page 83, we have sodium. Sodium is a positive. Positive, what's that called again? Cation. It's the most abundant electrolyte in the body. Primary electrolyte electrolyte in the extracellular fluid. Now, the way I remember this one is that, you know, when you sweat, what do you, what do you taste? Have you ever tasted your sweat when it dripped into your mouth? It's salty, isn't it? So extracellular is sodium. And I remember that from sweat. Uh, it plays a major role in the regulation of body fluid volumes. 
So we know usually water follows sodium, doesn't it? Uh, muscular activity, nerve impulse, conduction, and acid-base balance. To remember the role of sodium in water distribution, here we go. Think water goes where sodium is. So let's go to potassium. Potassium is a positive cation found mainly in the intracellular fluid. So it's the main one in intracellular, sodium extracellular. It's really important to remember that. So what's extracellular? Sodium, sweat, think. Intracellular in the cell is potassium. It's abundant in the cell. It's essential for normal membrane excitability. It's a critical factor in the transmission of nerve impulses. It's needed for protein synthesis, for the synthesis of breakdown of glycogen, and to maintain plasma acid-base balance. Chloride is an, and that's negative, so it's an anion, is an extracellular anion that is usually bound with other anions, especially sodium, sodium chloride. I'm sure you re remember those two go together. One's positive, one's negative cation anion. Its major function is to regulate osmotic pressure between fluid compartments and to assist in regulating acid-base balance. Then there's chloride. Chloride is an extracellular anion that is usually bound with other anions, especially sodium, sodium chloride, or potassium, potassium chloride. One's positive, one's negative. Its major function is to regulate osmotic pressure between fluid compartments and assist in regulating acid-base balance. Then there's calcium. Calcium is usually combined with phosphorus to form the mineral salts of the bones and teeth. 99% of the calcium is concentrated in the bones and teeth and only 1% in the extracellular fluid. We usually get calcium through diet, and it's absorbed through the intestine. That makes sense. We eat, it gets absorbed in the intestines. Calcium and phosphorus have a reciprocal relationship, meaning that if one falls, the other rises. And if one rises, the other falls. So calcium and phosphorus work together. So I'm going to the next page. Um, we're still talking about calcium. So if the serum calcium level falls, additional calcium is absorbed in the intestine, reabsorbed through the kidneys or taken from the bones. So if, bone, if the calcium has to remove from the bones, it's taken from the bloodstream and reabsorbed through the kidneys. Then there's magnesium. It's a cation that's found in bone and extracellular fluid. After potassium, magnesium is the most abundant cation in intracellular fluid. So it's vital to cellular function. You don't hear a lot about magnesium, do you? But it's really important. It plays a role in the metabolism of carbohydrates and proteins, the storage and use of intracellular energy, and neural transmission. In other words, it's important in the functioning of heart nerves and muscles. All right, let's go to non-electrolytes. Um, some examples of those. Now, these do not have a charge. Urea, protein, glucose, creatinine, and bilirubin. These solutes do not carry an electrical charge, but they are important in our body so now we can go to the transport of water and electrolytes. So now we're on the right page, page 84. So the selectively permeable membrane. It controls movement of water and certain solutes. Now what's a solute? It's one of those cations, anions, salt, sugar. Um, it has, 
It allows for the transportation of nutrients and waste to and from cells. For example, selective permeable membranes surround cells to separate fluid in the cells from fluid in the tissues. So if there's a membrane and some cells can easily go back and forth, some take a little push and some can't get through it all. Because if they're large, uh, they, they don't move through as quickly. So what are some transport processes? Now I'm gonna describe these to you and then I'm gonna show you some pictures of, of them in action so that it will sink into your brain so you can visualize what diffusion is. So diffusion is the random movement of particles in all directions, diffuse. The natural tendency is for a substance to move. Now this is important to know. That's why I put it here on the slide. Um, to, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. One example is the movement of oxygen from the alveoli to the pulmonary capillaries. So it's going to go from an area of high concentration to a lower area of lower concentration. Another example might be arteries. So arteries are bigger and then they go down to capillaries where there's less pressure. So high concentration of blood and oxygen in your arteries, lower concentration in capillaries because it gets smaller. Just like um, when it goes from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli. And you know, if you sit your patients up in bed, it will really help this uh, diffusion of oxygen. It will really aid in uh, helping them breathe better. So if you happen to walk in, and you find a patient's O2 sat is low, then sit them up, have them take a couple nice deep breaths and check that O2 sat again. And I guarantee you, unless there's some major problem, um, it will go up that O2 saturation will go. All right, so remember oxygen diffuses into the capillaries and is transported through the blood system to other parts of the body. So the next thing is active transport. Active transport, because that word active, something has to be pushing. So it's a it pumps sodium out of the cell. So it has to have energy. Carrier proteins can transport substances from an area of low concentration to an area of equal or greater concentration, but it needs energy or active transport. Many solutes such as sodium, potassium, and glucose and hydrogen are transported across the cell membrane. Now you remember, might remember this, the sodium potassium pump. Uh, the concentration of sodium is highest in extracellular fluid. Therefore, excess sodium cannot leave the cell by diffusion. Active transport pumps the excess sodium out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. So active transport needs a push, a pump. Now filtration Filtration is the transfer of water and solutes through a membrane from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Now, kidneys are our best illustration of filtration because we know that uh, our blood filters through our kidneys and then we get urea, filters out the bad stuff, the urea, um, and lets the, the uh, good go on into our blood system. So it's high pressure to an area of low pressure. The pressure is known as hydrostatic pressure and is a combination of pressures from the force of gravity on the fluid and pumping action of the heart. So that's important to remember. Perfusion through the kidneys requires uh, some gravity, you know, gravity from the kidney down the ureters into the bladder. Um, also, filtration 
is really important. Moving fluid out of the capillaries into the tissues and filtering plasma through the kidneys. So kidneys is kind of a, a good example of filtration. Again, filtration is going from high pressure to an area of low pressure. So let me give you another example. If the kidneys weren't good enough, think of, and I'm going to show you a picture also, but think about a shower head. So you've got, you turn on the water and you've got all this water that's ready to come out the shower head. And when it comes out, it diffuses out, it filtrates out. It goes from high pressure in the tubing to lower pressure as it spreads out over your body. So that's a good example. Um, then we've got osmosis. Now, did any of you see that movie, Osmosis Jones? Well, if you didn't, uh, osmosis is the movement of water, and that's the key word here. Osmosis always involves water. It's the movement of water across a membrane from less concentration to more concentration. But it needs water. So I want you to really remember this part that osmosis creates a better fluid balance. Because it's moving uh, the water across a membrane from low concentration to more concentration. It helps to create a better fluid balance. Then we've got osmolality, which is the concentration of a solution. So if you put salt in water, you've created osmolality. And however much salt you put into that water is going to depend on the osmolality of that fluid. If you put a lot of salt, it's going to be really salty tasting because it didn't all get dissolved. Uh, if you take sugar, same thing. You make lemonade um, and you put a little bit of sugar and it tastes just yummy and perfect, but then you put too much sugar in there, it's too sweet. So because the concentration of the sugar is just too much. So osmolality uh, is the concentration of salt or other solute, I gave you sugar, uh, is higher in the water because the solution contains less water. So if you put less water in, then it's going to be more dilute. If you have more water, it's going to be more dilute. So that's a good little piece of information here. So you'll see the term osmolarity used to refer to the concentration of particles in body water. Osmolality refers to the concentration of particles per liter of solution. Okay, now let me show you some examples. So here's diffusion. Diffusion is high concentration, notice the arrow, to low concentration. Diffusion is the movement from high concentration to lower concentration. This makes a lot of sense because you kind of want to even things out, right? Um, so when something's highly concentrated, it, it just wants to go through that. Notice that's a permeable membrane there in the middle. Um, and then it goes to an area of lower concentration. Next picture is active transport. Now, the reason I'm showing this picture is because it takes energy. It takes, that person is pushing that rock up the hill. It takes a lot of energy to do that. So active transport requires energy, expenditure of energy, lower concentration to an area of equal or greater concentration. Now this is filtration. So I gave an, two examples. One is you water your plant and you take a lot of water and put it in and then it, it just filters through the roots. Then if you go over to your water cooler, you have a water bottle that has a lot of pressure. 
But then when you open up the little, you know, spout, you just get out so much that you need. So that is a good example of filtration. Next we have, oh, it's blocked off. Oh, here, osmosis. So remember, osmosis always involves water. And it is the movement of water across a membrane from less concentration to more concentration. So see here in the first column there, you've got, they're, they're pretty equal. Then an osmosis occurs and you get more concentration in one area than another, thanks to the water. Okay. Now let's move on to kidneys. Because we talked about osmolality, so now we're on page 85. So kidneys and circulatory system are the main regulators of fluid balance. That's important to remember. I'm going to talk a lot about kidneys and lungs being a pH balance, but as far as fluid balance, kidneys and the heart or circulatory system um, is what's going to help us maintain our fluid balance. Because if our heart doesn't work right, we might retain fluid, right? Get edema. Um, if our kidneys don't work, same thing. We might get edema. So circulatory and kidney systems uh, influence our regulation of fluids. So what about the kidneys? Let's talk specifically about the kidneys. So the kidneys are the main regulators of fluid balance. They control extracellular by adjusting the concentration of electrolytes. The osmolality of body fluids the volume of extracellular fluid, blood volume, and pH. We're going to talk a lot about pH here. Remember, pH, what does that mean? It's the power of the hydrogen. So a pH balance, you're going to have, what is the normal pH? Remember? We'll get to that in a little bit so that uh, you'll remember. All right, so the nephron is the functioning unit of the kidney. We learned that. Each nephron is made up of a glomerulus and tubules, and they filter the nephron, and, and they're responsible for secretion and reabsorption. The nephrons conduct the work of a kidney through the process of filtration reabsorption and secretion. So filtration, the filtrate moves from the tubules where it is transferred into urine by the process of tubular reabsorption. So tubular reabsorption adjusts the volume and composition and prevents fluid loss. It excretes waste but prevents fluids from being lost. So when it says volume and composition, it prevents fluid from being lost, holding on to your urine, keeping you hydrated. Um, also the composition would be your waste products. Uh, then we've got, uh, I want you to remember here too about tubular reabsorption is it's important for adjusting the volume and composition. Oh, I said that for the second time. Hmm, must be important. Adjusting the volume and composition of the fluid and it prevents excessive fluid loss. So holds on to the urine. So that's why sometimes urine might be concentrated because um, the body's holding on to as much fluid as it can so it doesn't get dehydrated. Then so tubular secretion, it's the last phase of the work of the kidneys. And during this phase, the filtrate is transformed into urine. 
so it secretes urine. Uh, it, various substances, among them drugs, hydrogen ions, potassium ions, creatinine, histamine, pass from the blood into the tubules, and they're eliminated. And it helps maintain electrolyte balance and metabolic waste products. So it gets rid of the waste products and maintains our electrolyte balance. Let's talk about hormones now on page 85. So I think we've talked about this before, but it's really important. And uh, there's probably one here that we haven't talked about before, but renin, we've talked about renin, angiotensin in the kidneys, how those um, keep the blood pressure up. Uh, but it talks about here, uh, renin is a hormone that is secreted when blood volume or blood pressure falls. Renin activates angiotensin, a substance secreted by the liver to form angiotensin 1. And that helps to hold on to sodium and water so that we keep our blood pressure up. Does that make sense? So renin is secreted when blood pressure falls so that we don't let it fall, so that we can retain on into the fluid. Then aldosterone is released by the adrenal glands. Now the adrenal glands sit right on top of the kidneys in response to the hormone renin. Aldosterone acts on the kidney tubules to release the resorption of sodium. So again, it's trying to keep the blood pressure up. It's a volume regulator. It acts on the tubules, increasing the reabsorption of sodium. Because the retention of sodium causes water retention, water follows sodium, aldosterone acts as a volume regulator. Okay, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, produced by the hypothalamus and is secreted into the general circulation by the posterior pituitary gland. It causes the capillaries to resorb, reabsorb more water so that urine is more concentrated and less volume is excreted. So antidiuretic, it prevents you from getting rid of water prevents you from diuresing. And then this last one, atrial naturetic factor. So atria, heart, naturetic. So what this does is it's a hormone released by the atria of the heart. And as the heart, the atria of the heart expands, fills with fluid, our blood volume, the uh, AT, ANA, excuse me, ANF stimulates excretion of sodium and water by the kidneys, decreased synthesis of renin, decreased release of aldosterone and vasodilation. And all this is to reduce blood volume and lower blood pressure. So as the heart feels like, oh, I'm filling up too much, I'm getting too much fluid in here. I need help. So in comes our retinin, our dosterone, and they help us get rid of the fluid. All right, I think I have a special slide here about thirst, just because it's important. Because usually a person doesn't get thirsty or let's put it this way, when a person gets thirsty, they're probably already hypovolemic. They probably are already in a state of, hype, uh, of dehydration. So the hypothalamus triggers the sensation of thirst. So when you feel thirsty, you need to take a drink because your brain tells you to, and it knows everything, right? So I'm gonna take a drink right now, actually because my brain says so. 
All right. Also, the thing about thirst is that more sodium and less water in the body makes a person thirsty. So if you eat a bag of chips, what happens? You eat a lot of salt. I know you guys do. What happens? You get thirsty, right? You got to have something to drink. So sodium and less water in the body makes a person thirsty. So when you're taking in sodium, it automatically tells you to take a drink to get some fluid. Okay, so thirst is important. And you know, in the elderly, they lose some of this. They lose some desire for thirst. In fact, we're gonna talk about that right now. Some age-related changes affecting fluids. And if you notice on page 86, it has a table 6.3, about 24-hour intake and output of fluids. Uh, you should take in fluids by liquids. There's some uh, water or fluid in food. And really, they should equal, I should equal O. Intake should equal output, right? Now, we do have some losses, sensible losses of sweat, tears, um, that, and even when we breathe, we, we're breathing out a little bit of water. So we do, we call that sensible losses and sensible losses. So maybe, the intake's a little more than the output, but it shouldn't be much, right? Not much. We want to keep the I equal to the O. And in your book, it talks about um, the usual adult. Urine volume is one to two liters per day. Water loss through the lungs, a rate of 300 to 400 mLs per day in a hot, dry environment. Water can be lost through skin and lungs. That can increase. In the GI tract, we can lose water. And sometimes diarrhea makes you lose even more water than you should. So you see, diarrhea, breathing too fast, sweating if you have a fever, all those affect your fluid balance. And upsets the electrolytes too because it all works in it together it's all maintaining homeostasis so let's talk about some age-related changes that we're going to see so an aging kidney is slower to adjust to changes in acid base fluid and electrolyte balances so it, it's slower it doesn't act as fast so the aging kidney slower to adjust. An older person has limited reserves. They're already in a hypovolemic state. So they have limited reserves. So when they start losing fluid, then they really go bad quick. Uh, you may monitor fluid status in the older person and the be alert for signs and symptoms of imbalance, including disorientation. That can be a sign of a dehydration leading to an electrolyte imbalance. So these are the, the clues that you guys have. Now, they're non-specific, aren't they? But they mean something. So when someone started acting a little bit funny, you got to take that as is something going on and, and you got to play detective. All right, so be alert for signs and symptoms of imbalance, including disorientation. And this is new disorientation. Somebody who was once oriented is now not. Or confused. Constipated. And then they start falling from postural hypotension. So our chapter on falls has to do with postural hypotension. And so does medication, by the way. So if a patient always needs to sit for a little while before they stand up to allow all those fluids to uh, balance out in their body, um, 
But if they don't have enough fluid in their body, they're going to fall anyway and are going to have a hypotension. All right, so some other things. Um, total body water declines with age. Greatest loss from the intracellular fluid compartment. I think I skipped over older adult often has a reduced sense of thirst. They don't have the desire to thirst. They don't have the desire to take a drink. And they might be weak and they might be tired and they forget to take a drink. So it's our job to offer them fluids every time we go in. And with our pills that we give them, be sure they drink enough fluids so they don't stay in that state of chronic dehydration. And then the body declines with age. I mentioned that. Also, older person has limited reserves to maintain fluid balance. So when something abnormal happens, whether it be diarrhea, vomiting, uh, maybe they start bleeding for some reason, they can't tolerate it. They get affected. Their blood pressure gets affected. Their mentation gets affected. So be alert to that. Antihypertensives, diuretics, and the acids also contribute to imbalances. So if you're taking a blood pressure medication, that can affect your balance and your fluid balance. Diuretics, they get rid of extra water, hopefully, but what if they get rid of more water than they should? Because you didn't drink enough to begin with. So that can affect your fluid balance and you're in a more dehydrated state. And then acids, because they have bicarb, and they can contribute to an imbalance. Okay. Now let's assess our patients for fluid and electrolyte balance. So that's starting on page 86. I'm going to take another drink of water. Doesn't this chapter make you want to drink water? <laughs> All right. So you want to take a good history now. Um, okay, I'll finish this thought. A complete health history determines whether the patients have any conditions that contribute to any electrolyte imbalance. So do they have vomiting? Do they have diarrhea? How's their kidneys? How's their kidney function? Do they have diabetes? Salicylate poisoning. Now what is salicylates? Aspirin. So that's really important to remember. Aspirin poisoning, burns. Remember when we did the burn chapter and we talked about fluid losses during burns? Well, that can really affect the patient if they have a history of that. Congestive heart failure, then maybe they're retaining too much fluid. Cerebral injuries. Now, we have um, some things in our brain that tell us to hold on to fluid and some that tell us to get rid of fluid. Antidiuretic hormone or SIADH. That's another thing we haven't learned yet, but it makes us just have urine output like you could never believe. Fluid, uh, liters and liters of fluid, and that's a condition, it's a problem, but it's a brain injury. It occurs with brain injuries. Um, ulcerative colitis, where they have diarrhea. We've talked about that. Now that's not only blood, but diarrhea. And then hormonal imbalances. Maybe they have a thyroid condition. Other risk factors, um, drugs like diuretics, cathartics, and medical interventions such as gastric suctioning. So if they have an NG tube, that's suctioning out fluid and what else? What else is in your stomach? Acid. So it's pumping out acid and fluid. So you're going to get into an electrolyte imbalance with that. Anticipate fluid and electrolyte imbalances to patients who are at risk. If they complain of fatigue. Now I know we, we might complain of fatigue because we're just so busy, right? But an elderly person isn't busy, but they feel tired. 
So tired, well, is an electrolyte imbalance? Are they anemic? Why are they feeling tired? You need to think about that. Do they have palpitations in their heart? Is that because they have too much volume? They don't have enough volume? Or do they just naturally have atrial fibrillation because their heart uh, isn't working properly? But then what does that make them at risk for? I'm gonna throw this in here. Stroke, right? They can throw a clot up to their brain and they can have a stroke. So we have to be really alert to these heart irregularities and we're going to find as we found out potassium can affect our heart in many different ways and that is one of the things we're going to have a heart abnormality palpitation dizziness edema muscle weakness or cramps dyspnea and confusion so these are all electrolyte disturbances. Now they can be confirmed with, you can, you can look at the patient, you can document things that you're seeing, but lab values is what's going to tell us what their actual serum blood, uh, electrolyte levels are. Now I mentioned here, let's go to box 6.1, which is over on the next page, page 88. And it talks about vital sign changes with fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So their pulse, is it increased rate with fluid volume deficit, sodium deficit or magnesium deficit? Uh, is it decreased? Is it weak or strong, bounding? These are descriptive words to use pulses. Respirations. So the fluid volume excess can cause pulmonary edema with dyspnea and tachypnea. Changes in respiratory function are noted also with acid-base balances. So you have slow, shallow respirations with periods of apnea, with metabolic alkalosis. We're going to be talking about that soon, shortly. Uh, deep, rapid respirations indicate metabolic acidosis, like Kussmaul's respirations. Temperature, do they have a fever that would increase their metabolic rate, cause fluid loss, increase respiratory rate, which causes fluid loss? And also, remember, fever increases the metabolic rate in the body, too. So it needs more. But if it's not getting more, if it's getting less, it's going to get worse. So fevers need to be taken care of. But they're also a sign that something's wrong. So you gotta fix what's wrong. Blood pressure, so a fall in systolic pressure of more than 20 when the patient changes from lying to sitting uh, meets fluid volume deficit. It's postural hypotension. Fluid volume excess that expands blood volume raises the blood pressure. Okay, now let's go to box 6.2. This is a focused assessment of INO. Um, serous fluid and electrolyte imbalances can be averted by carefully monitoring uh, records of fluid intake and output. So see how important INO is. Accurate INO. If the total intake is substantially more than the total output, the patient's in danger of fluid volume excess. Intake should include all fluids taken into the body, oral fluids, foods that are liquid at room temperature. So fluids, anything that's liquid at room temperature. Jello could be a fluid, right? Because it gets watery at room temperature. Ice cream, same thing. IV fluids, sub-Q fluids, fluids instilled into drainage tubes or irrigants. So if they're put in and not taken out, their intake. Output measures urine, vomit, diarrhea, uh, drainage from fistulas or suction machines, excessive perspiration. When someone starts perspiring profusely, something's wrong. That's not normal. 
When something isn't normal, something's wrong. <laughs> that was a profound statement, wasn't it? All right. So I think this is interesting. So measurement of body weight is a good indicator of fluid loss or retention. One liter of fluid, now picture this, one liter of fluid weighs 2.2 pounds. Now in the ICU, we used to keep track. Daily weights was a big deal to us because it helped tell us how much fluid that patient was retaining. Yeah, we were keep, keeping I and O, but you only know what goes in and what comes out. You don't know what's staying in, but weight can tell you. Sorry, I just took another drink. This chapter. All right. So a patient can accumulate up to 10 pounds of fluid before pitting edema is evident. Think of that. So when you get pitting edema, when you measure your patient's pitting edema, they've already put on weight, extra fluid weight. And that puts stress on their heart and their whole body and their blood pressure gets higher. All right, to monitor fluid status, weigh the patient daily on the same scale, same time, same amount of clothes. <laughs> I want to say the word naked, naked, then they have no clothes on at all. All right, so skin. So what? how's their color, their skin turker, or do they have edema? So turker, so I'll tell you what, in the elderly, Turker, Turker is not as good of an indicator of fluid balance because their skin is so wrinkly that you can tent their skin just because there's extra skin there. So it's not the perfect um, indicator of fluid balance, but edema will tell you they have extra fluid. They're retaining it, not getting rid of it. Uh, pitting edema, as you know, is depression in the tissue after you apply pressure, pressure with your fingertip. And then it ranges from 1 plus to 4 plus. Mucous membranes. So tongue turker. This is on page 89. So tongue turker. In a normal person, the tongue has one longitudinal furrow. So right down the middle is called a furrow. But if they're deficient in their fluid volume, they might have more longitudinal furrows. Tongue is smaller as a result of fluid loss. And sodium excess causes the tongue to appear red and swollen. So think about when you eat all those chips, right? Your tongue gets kind of irritated from eating all those, that salty food. All right, a dry mouth may be the result of deficient fluid volume or mouth breathing. So normally saliva is pooled in the area where the cheek and the gum meet. Uh, veins, how about JVD? Jugular vein distension. And the veins in the hands can suggest either deficient or excess fluid volume. So, you know, I know you guys measure for JVD on your head to toe. It's very unusual to see that because that person is in trouble if they've got JVD. They've got heart failure, frank heart failure. Um, hand, uh, so now let's go to the next one and talk about some tests. So some diagnostic tests and procedures. So there's urine studies where you check the urine pH. Uh, the kidneys can change the acidity or alkalinity of the urine by excreting hydrogen ions, the power of the hydrogen. Uh, urine pH is a measure of hydrogen ions in the urine. It's useful for determining whether the kidneys are responding to uh, metabolic acid base imbalances. Urine specific gravity. 
It's a measure of urine concentration. Normal is 1.016 to 1.022. It's a good indicator of fluid balance. It really is, it's a good one. A high specific gra gravity indicates that there's more concentration in the urine. A low specific gravity indicates the urine contains a large amount of water. Okay, we'll turn the page and we'll go to urine osmolality. We talked about blood osmolality. So osmolality measures the number of dissolved particles in a solution. This information provides a more precise measurement of the kidney's ability to concentrate urine, even than the specific gravity. So dilute urine has a low osmolality because there's not a lot of waste products in there, just mostly urine, and generally reflects renal excretion of excess water. Then there's urine creatinine clearance, used to detect glomerular damage in the kidney. Remember, creatinine is a great uh, modulator of how the kidneys are doing. Sometimes they order a 24-hour urine creatinine clearance. So in this case, the patient's instructed to void, discard that specimen. So if you're doing a 24-hour urine creatinine clearance, they throw away their first urine, then you take their next urine, and then you start putting that in the jug. Urine sodium reflects sodium intake and fluid volume status. Urine potassium, I'm going to go through these just a little bit faster than some of the other things. Uh, urine potassium is a measure of renal tubular function. Sometimes they do a 24-hour specimen to see if the patient's excreting potassium more at night than in the day. Blood studies. So the hematocrit is the percentage of blood volume that's composed of red blood cells. We know that. An increased hematocrit is seen with deficient fluid volume. Now I want to talk about this for a second We'll talk about it again a couple more times. And that is hemodilution. What that means is hemo, blood, dilution means there's a lot of fluid in there, so everything's diluted. So an increased hematocrit is seen with deficient fluid volume. So if it's less volume, not diluted, the hematocrit is going to be high because it's in concentrated fluid and dehydration because the blood is more concentrated. A low hematocrit is consistent with excess fluid volume because of dilution, dilutional. So this happens a lot of times when patients are bleeding and they order IV fluids, right? And the IV fluids are pouring into their into their veins and um, the hematocrit drops even more. It's not because they're bleeding. It's because it's dilutional. The hematocrit has been diluted with all the fluid going in. Sometimes doctors get a little confused about that. Uh, the normal range of hematocrit is 40 to 54 for men and 38 to 47 for women. Uh, serum creatinine, metabolic waste product. It's a good indicator of renal function even better than BUN. Uh, the BUN is uh, associated with deficient fluid volume. Serum osmolality, measured measure of blood concentration. Serum albumin, so albumin, so important, it's a protein. So albumin is a plasma protein that helps maintain blood volume by creating colloid osmotic pressure. So the elderly a lot of times have a low protein, low albumin floating in their blood vessels. And remember there's some, some drugs that bind to albumin 
And if that drug can't bind to albumin because they don't have enough, then they might uh, get over medicated with the medication. So we have to remember that. We also have to remember in our liver patients, they have a low albumin and that colloidal pressure moves albumin and fluid into their abdomen and they get that big belly. So a low serum albumin allows water to shift into the interstitial compartment so they can get edematous because uh, there's no albumin to hold the fluid into their blood vessels, so it goes into their tissues. It can also go into their abdomen. Can drop their blood pressure too because it decreases their blood volume. That fluid has moved to another space. So we've talked about some studies, tests, and procedures. So let's talk about fluid imbalances. So on page 85, one of the things it talks about, if you went back to page 85, there's an important, right under regulatory mechanisms, it says that kidneys and circulatory system are influenced by the sympathetic nervous system, but they regulate fluid balance kidneys and circulatory system regulate fluid balance. I know we're going to talk a lot about kidneys and lungs, but that's pH balance. But fluid balance is going to be kidneys and circulatory system. Our heart, remember that ANF, and our kidneys with our antidiuretic hormone. So all those, the kidneys and the circulatory system help to keep us regulated or an imbalance or homeostasis. So let's go back to page 91, fluid imbalances, fluid volume deficit, and fluid volume overload. So deficient fluid volume, there's many different ways to say it, right? Fluid volume deficit, hypovolemia, dehydration, deficient fluid volume, all the same way to say the same thing. You don't have enough fluid. So on page 91, before we go to the table, I want you to look at the dots on page 91. See those dots? It starts with fluid volume deficit. So this is uh, treatment varies somewhat according to the cause of a fluid volume deficit and the severity of symptoms. Nursing care should be based on specific patient problems. And those should include fluid volume deficit or potential for potential for fluid volume deficit related to inadequate fluid intake, excessive fluid loss, high blood glucose. Remember, one of the symptoms of a high glucose or diabetes is polyuria. So you've got a lot of urine coming out. So that's why it says high blood glucose, because it's going to make you pee a lot. Inadequate antidiuretic hormone. So you don't have enough of the antidiuretic hormone to hold on to that fluid. Production or effect. Uh, that was ADH, production or effect. High fever can make you lose fluid from sweat. And altered capillary permeability. So the shifts of the fluid from the vascular spaces into the interstitial spaces. Um, that's really important. So what would you do for fluid volume deficit? You might have to give them fluids, right? As long as their heart and kidneys can tolerate that. Because if they have a fever they need, and they're losing fluids, they need to drink. If they're having excessive fluid loss from diarrhea, they need to drink. So by increasing the fluids, you can combat that deficient fluid volume from some of these deficits that they've had. And remember, cognitive disturbance related to decreased cerebral tissue perfusion is another one that you might find constipation, 
There's not enough fluid um, water from stool in the colon. Poor activity tolerance related to decreased blood volume, decreased tissue perfusion. Poor activity tolerant, tolerance, I said that. Elevated body temperature related to an infection that gives them decreased fluid volume because they're sweating. Potential for injury related to decreased level of consciousness. Potential disruption in skin integrity related to poor tissue turgor. So if they have a disruption in their skin, a tear, a decubitus, they can lose fluids through there. And then their fluid volume deficient. Inadequate circulation uh, related to decreased cardiac output. So those are some things that can lead to fluid volume deficit. Let's look at that table now. 6.5. It's a big table. Talks about fluid volume deficit. Talks about the definition. Deficiency of water and electrolytes. The etiology or why it's happening. Because they're not taking in enough fluids. Or they have a fluid loss. Or they have a shift. In their fluids. So some focused assessment findings you would find their blood pressure hypotension because they don't have enough volume. Their pulse is weak but it's rapid because it's trying to keep up. It's trying to get enough fluid into all the major organs. Respirations are rapid. Temperature might be decreased. Weight loss because of loss of fluid. Tis, uh, tissue turgor could be normal. Mucous membrane moist. Now this is important. We talked about this once before. I'm going to talk about it again. And that's the blood cells. So in fluid volume deficit or deficient fluid volume, their hemoglobin and chromatocrit might be increased because they have less volume so their blood cells are kind of pushed together. So they're increased. It's not a sign that they're necessarily doing better. They're not anemic anymore. It means that their volume is decreased. Okay. Uh, urine output would be decreased. Thirst might be normal or they might not, because remember, they just don't have that thirst. Um, treatment would be correction of the underlying cause. So whatever it is, water and electrolyte replacement, antiemetics, antidiarrheals, oral or IV fluids. Now, I know you can give oral fluids. We can't give IV fluids without a doctor's order. So the doctor needs to be notified when you see some of these things happening to your patient. So it's really important for you to notice what's going on with your patient. And if you're not at the bedside, your CNA is. So when she reports something to you, be sure you notice that. Go check it out. See if it's true. Because she's at the bedside for sure a lot, right? And if you've got a really good CNA, which it's really great if you do, um, you can even train them what to look for. You know, be sure you let me know if uh, they get dizzy when they stand up. Be, you know, you can help train them so they can be your eyes. Because you can't be everywhere either. But um, anyway, a good CNA is great. Uh, so you're going to treat the underlying cause. Antiemetics, antidiarrheals, IV fluids, uh, nursing care. So protect edematous tissue with third spacing. So whenever they're edematous, they don't have good blood flow in that area because it's filled with fluid. So they're third. What, that's what we call third spacing. It's going into another space than uh, than the uh, blood vessel space. Assist with rising because they might become dizzy. 
keep hourly records of I and O. All right, let's notice, um, now that's hypovolemia, not in the volume. Also here is dehydration, which is a deficiency of water without electrolyte deficiency. So you can look through there. Same thing under the blood loss, where their blood cells, the hemoglobin and hematocrit, are increased because they have less volume. So I'm going to go back now to fluid volume excess on page 91. We talked about deficient fluid volume, fluid volume deficit. Now let's talk about fluid volume excess. So the two types of third volume excess, I said third, I meant fluid. The two types of fluid volume excess are extracellular fluid excess, isotonic fluid excess, and intracellular water excess or hypotonic fluid excess. Isotonic IV fluids are the administration of D5W in water after surgery or trauma is one way of isotonic IV fluids. Uh, the body attempts to compensate for fluid volume excess by increasing the filtration and excretion of sodium and water by the kidneys and decreasing ADH. That is the perfect statement of homeostasis, where the body is trying to compensate for too much volume. So it's got too much volume. And so the body, what does the body do? It tries to increase the filtration and excretion of sodium and water by the kidneys and decreases the production of antidiuretic. So it decreases the production of ADH, which causes antidiuretic. So it wants you to diurese because you've got too much volume. So that's the, your body working in its natural way to keep yourself in homeostasis. That is awesome. So as with fluid volume deficit, the severity of the symptoms of fluid volume excess depends on how quickly the condition develops. So severe fluid volume excess can cause or aggravate heart failure and pulmonary edema. So the heart can go into failure and they can have pulmonary edema and those are, could be both life threatening. So let's turn the page. and um, talk about those dots there, uh, the fluid volume excess related to fluid retention, uh, cognitive dysfunction related to cerebral edema. So too much fluid can even go to your head and, and you get cerebral edema. Falling can cause cerebral edema too. Activity intolerance. So because you have fluid in your lungs. You aren't able to exchange or diffuse that oxygen into your alveoli. So because it's filled with fluid, so decreased oxygenation occurs. So when you do your O2 sat and it's low, so and you sit them up, right? Doesn't help. Listen to their lungs. What do you hear? Do you hear fluid, a rattling sound? Do you hear wheezing? What do you hear? Listen to the bases, not just the front at the top. Listen to the bases. You can hear fluid there. You can hear, it's, it's, it'll sound uh, like there's fluid in, in the bases of the lungs. That's pulmonary edema. And then that, with them having trouble breathing, and their oxygen being low, so there's a problem. Good thing, call your doctor. He might order diuretic, breathing treatment, whatever he orders, um, you can help the patient. So there's a potential for disrupted skin integrity related to edema because lack of blood flow in that area. What if there's laying up against a, a bed railing and not getting good blood flow, they can get skin breakdown. And then that disrupted skin integrity fluid comes out of the tissues and then they're losing fluid there. 
So because they had excess fluid volume, now they're going to get deficient fluid volume. Uh, inadequate circulation related to reduced cardiac output with heart failure. And inadequate circulation related to reduced cardiac output with heart failure. I just said that. All right, so now let's go to table 6.6 .6, right across the way where it says fluid volume excess. So the definition is excess of both water and electrolytes, major symptoms caused by increased blood volume. So too much volume. Etiology or what's it caused by? Retention of water and electrolytes related to kidney disease or an overload of IV fluids. Maybe they're getting too much IV fluids. That's extracellular. Then intracellular, excess body water without excess electrolytes. Major symptoms are caused by cerebral edema. Overhydration in presence of renal failure. Administration of D5W after surgery or trauma. If if you do work in an ER or um, a hospital situation where they're getting IVs, maybe OR, post-op, maybe uh, where they get procedures, straight D5W is not usually just given because that is uh, not the normal isotonic condition of our fluids, of our blood vessels in our in our um, blood system. So we're gonna get overhydrated with that because that's not normal for us. I, that would be a D5 normal saline is more isotonic or more close to what our blood vessels have. All right, so I'll let you look through here. Um, it's the opposite of fluid volume deficit. So you're gonna have high blood pressure, bounding pulse, crackles and dyspnea with the respirations, a weight gain, edema, distended neck veins, moist mucous membranes. Now your hemoglobin and hematocrit are going to be decreased because you have so much volume. They're diluted. Irritability, confusion, lethargy, engorged hand veins, Pupils might be sluggish due to cerebral edema. So you got to treat the underlying cause, give them diuretics uh, to promote fluid elimination. Now this is this is an interesting thing. Digitalis to improve cardiac output. There's another part we talk about digitalis uh, in in a little bit. This is a long lecture. I realize that. It's a lot of information, important information. And not only am I trying to give you information that you need to know, maybe for the test or for an NCLEX question, but also how do you take care of your patients? Because that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be taking care of patients. You're going to be assessing your patients. So it's important that you know these things. All right, the nursing care, give drugs, IV fluids as ordered, monitor diuresis, so your INO, um, explain and enforce fluid restriction, offer ice chips. They're going to feel thirsty because you're, you're getting rid of the fluid, so they might feel thirsty at first. All right, protect the demodus tissue, reposition your patient. Inspect for signs of uh, skin breakdown. All right, now we're going to get into some more things, more interesting things. We're going to talk about electrolyte imbalances. So let's talk about hyponatremia, low sodium, sodium deficient. So the causes include excessive intake of water without sodium hyponatremia, low sodium, because they drank so much water, it's diluted. Maybe vomiting, diarrhea, or diaphoresis with only water replacement. The use of distilled water to irrigate body cavities. So you should use uh, saline 
to irrigate body cavities and excessive secretion of ADH. Increased ADH or antidiuretic hormone secretion is associated with stress, some head injuries, and a condition called, and this is what I was talking about before, SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. That's a head injury or a tumor, something that's affected in the head. Um, sodium normally holds water in the extracellular compartment because where is sodium? Extracellular, what's intracellular? Potassium. So when serum, serum sodium is low, water can enter cells more freely. This shift of fluids is most significant in relation to brain cells. So your assessment um, monitors signs and symptoms, which would include headache, muscle weakness, fatigue, confusion, apathy, abdominal cramping, and orthostatic hypotension. They just don't have the sodium. The water didn't follow the sodium this time. So they, they just don't have enough sodium for the water to follow, right? Uh, usual treatment for hyponatremia is restriction of fluids while the kidneys excrete excess water, and then they get back to homeostasis. Nursing care, so, um, Prevent hyponatremia in patients with feeding tubes by using normal saline rather than water for irrigation. So I'm on page 94. Uh, measure fluid I and O and assess mental status. Monitor lab test results. If the patient's confused, take safety measures to prevent injury. Now hypernatremia sodium excess. It's a very serious imbalance that can lead to death if not corrected. The high level of sodium in the serum and other extracellular fluids causes water to shift out of the cells, which creates cellular dehydration. Some causes of hypernatremia are vomiting, diarrhea, diaphoresis, profuse sweating, uh, and insufficient ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Medical treatment, oral or IV replacement of water to restore imbalance. Low sodium diet. This is hypernatremia, so don't want them to have too much salt. Uh, nursing care. So encourage patients with hypernatremia to drink water for hydration. And why would that be? It dilutes the sodium. So they're not so hypernatremic. All right. Uh, be sure you monitor their cardiac and renal function, their I and O. Recognize signs and symptoms of fluid retention or depletion. Okay, let's talk about hypokalemia. It's a low serum potassium, kalemia. There's a K in that kalemia and that's potassium. Causes include vomiting, diarrhea, NG suction, inadequate intake of potassium, diabetic acidosis, excessive aldosterone secretion and drugs uh, such as potassium wasting diuretics and corticosteroids. Uh, because potassium is necessary for normal cellular function, you can have deficiency in GI, renal, cardiovascular, and neurologic disturbances. Signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, anorexia, abdominal distension, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle cramps, weakness, dysrhythmias. That's really a bad one. Ignore abnormal cardiac rhythms, postural hypotension, dyspnea, shallow respirations. Important, huh? Hyperkalemia, 
well, no, let's not go there yet. Let's go to um, nursing care. So monitor heart rate and rhythm uh, of patients taking digitalis is important because hypokalemia increases the risk of dig toxicity. Administer prescribed oral potassium supplements, a full glass of water or fruit juice to prevent GI irritation. That potassium, ugh, it tastes yucky. Um, they do have slow K pills, slow potassium pills, but then the patient doesn't get the potassium as quickly. So uh, liquid potassium tastes salty for some reason, but it tastes yucky. So the patients don't want to drink it. So give it with fruit juice. Um, administer IV potassium as ordered. Now, this is important. Um, I know LVNs, we don't give IV drugs, but I believe you can give IV potassium, but it's never given IV push. Never, never, ever, ever, ever. It's too, de it's too irritating to uh, the blood vessel, number one. And number two, uh, if you give it directly, it goes right to the heart and you can have uh, <clears throat> problems with the heart. So it's usually, an, the infusion rate generally should not exceed 10 milliequivalents and it's given in milliequivalents. We used to do 20 MEQs or milliequivalents in 50 mLs of water. So it has to be diluted and you have to closely monitor the rate that it's being given. Uh, the risk of cardiac arrest with rapid infusion. So I'm going to turn the page. Even though there's some uh, boxes here on page 95, guidelines for sodium restriction. So you should be aware of foods. Remember anything smoked or cured, anything salted, pickles, all those things. I know they're yummy, but they have a high sodium. And if a patient should be on sodium restriction, if they have heart problems, they need to be on low sodium. No added salt. You flavor their foods with other things, garlic powder or uh, Mrs. Dash's, is that what it's called, Mrs. Dash? Yeah. Uh, and then there's also on box 6.6 .6, sodium content in common foods. Um, we always think of bananas as being high in potassium. Uh, but avocados are high too. So take a peek at that. Some vegetables have potassium in them also. It's always better to get your electrolytes, uh, these charged ions, right? Uh, better to get them in food than having to take them as a pill or a liquid. So let's turn the page. Let's keep talking. I'm gonna keep talking about hypokalemia. This is something important here. So we're on the top of page 96 now. Um, check the patient's urine output before starting an IV infusion of potassium. That's important to know. Why? Because when the urine output is low, IV fluids without potassium may be given until the urine output is acceptable and then fluids with potassium are started. Urine output should be no less than 30 mLs an hour. If it's less than 30 mLs an hour for two consecutive days or two consecutive hours, alert the physician who may stop the infusion. Okay, now, so that pharmacologic capsule, potassium is always diluted before given IV, never administered by IV push. Rapid infusion of potassium can cause cardiac arrest. All right, now let's talk about hyperkalemia or potassium excess. Because um, it's so plentiful in foods, a lot of people would get too much. The kidneys do not readily conserve potassium, so continuous replacement is necessary. Patients at risk 
for hyperkalemia? This is important to know. So who's at risk for hyperkalemia? Let's think about it. Well, probably kidney patients, right? Because if they can't excrete potassium, then they're going to have too much. Diabetics, because diabetics have renal function problems. Remember, um, diabetes affects the heart, the kidneys, eyes. It can affect a lot of things. So when a patient's diabetic, you're not just poking their finger for a blood sugar. There's a lot of things that can go on with a diabetic. So patients at risk for hyperkalemia, decreased renal function, people in metabolic acidosis, we'll be talking about that shortly, and people taking potassium supplements, decreased renal function like in diabetics. Another really, really important thing to know is the next sentence that says, Hyperkalemia is a serious imbalance because of the potential for life-threatening dysrhythmias. Now, I think I've probably said that a couple times. Potassium is dangerous to the heart. Elevated uh, potassium typically causes first bradycardia, then tachycardia, and it can even lead to cardiac arrest. So hyperkalemia, very dangerous to the heart. Medical treatment, uh, correct the underlying causes and restrict potassium intake. Now, there's a drug called Kxlate. We talked about that, I believe, in liver patients to make them go to the bathroom. Um, that's also something that helps pull potassium out of the blood system. It's a drug that can be given orally or rectally, promotes excretion of excess potassium through the intestinal tract. So they will get diarrhea though. Uh, IV calcium gluconate or calcium chloride may be given if the patient's having cardiac arrhythmias. All right, let's go to nursing care of the patient with hyperkalemia, because this is important too. Patients with low urine output are those taking potassium sparing diuretics must be monitored carefully for signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia because their kidneys aren't allowed because of the medicine to get rid of the potassium. If they have low urine output, they can't get rid of the potassium, so it builds up and they get hyperkalemia. And then that leads to what? Heart problems, maybe even cardiac arrest. So to prevent hyperkalemia in patients receiving potassium supplements, um, monitor their IV fluids if they're getting an IV, screen their labs, serum potassium levels greater than five can cause cardiac arrest. Uh, liver patients, kidney patients, both of those can get a really high potassium quickly. It's important to look at your lab values. So learn your labs. Um, there was one YouTube I was watching, because I, I was watching a lot of YouTubes about acid-based balance. So you guys can do that too. I didn't find one that I thought would be perfect for everyone. It just depends the way you learn. Michael Linares, L-I-N-A-R-E-S, has a really good one, but it's kind of silly. But if you learn by silly, then maybe that's a good one for you. Um, you can also listen to Registered Nurse RN. She has a good one on acidosis, alkalosis, acid-based balance. Um, I really, really recommend listening to these YouTubes. I can start posting some. Maybe I'll post a couple. Uh, you can listen to them if you like them. Great. If you don't, well, listen to the other one. Find one that you like. I must have listened to five of them. And you know, I know this stuff, guys, but I wanna teach you and you just never wanna forget these situations because it can cause harm to your patients. So um, just, it's knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have, the more you know about these situations, 
uh, the smarter you'll be. I want to tell you a story real quick. I had a patient. No, no, no. I had a student. She texted me the other day. This was recent. And she said, Debbie, does carbon retaining CO2, does retaining CO2 make you have hallucinations? And I said, well, absolutely it does. We're going to get to acidosis pretty soon. And I said, absolutely it does. And she goes, I knew it because this patient, she was having hallucinations. She was acting weird. She was trying to take her clothes off. She had a change in mental status. Well, so my, my student thought that it was respiratory because they were trying to wean this patient from the vent. So she had her transferred to the hospital because of a change in their status. And sure enough, she was retaining CO2. She got put in the ICU and uh, on a ventilator because they had to get off that CO2. She was becoming very acidotic. So, you know, just that hypervigilance of seeing something abnormal can make you realize something's going on with your patient. You're not sure what, and maybe you're not. Maybe you just have to send them to the hospital and let them figure it out. But catching it, is key. All right, sorry, sorry, went off key, went off uh, subject there. So we were talking about hyperkalemia. Uh, we were talking about the potassium level of five. I can tell you another story about a patient that uh, the student, the student nurse, she did not wake up her patient for breakfast. She didn't do her head to toe before breakfast. She didn't wake, she tried to wake the patient up, but she was still sleeping. Uh, so she didn't wake her up for breakfast. She let her sleep. 10 o'clock in the morning, the patient was still sleeping. I said, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to wake your patient up. So when we tried to wake the patient up, we couldn't wake her up. She did not wake up shaking her. She did not wake up rubbing her sternum. The sternal rub is something that you would do uh, when someone's comatose. Uh, her potassium was six. So she was had to be sent to the hospital. Um, because she was unconscious, she was unresponsive. She did not die, just so you know. But, um, you know, it's things like that, though, that ruin your whole day. It happened in the morning. So the whole rest of the day is thrown off. All right. Uh, so we were talking about hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest and reporting to the doctor if there's a change in uh, the heart rate or the. Uh, and monitor them for signs and symptoms of other abnormal potassium levels. All right, now let's go to chloride imbalance. Now notice that's imbalance. I'm not giving you a hyper hypo situation here, only imbalance. So because chloride is bound to other electrolytes, chloride imbalance accompanies other electrolyte imbalances. So hyper High serum chloride, known as hyperchloremia, is associated with metabolic acidosis. Low serum chloride, hypochloremia, occurs when sodium is lost. So it, it's a bind, it binds with something. It's, it's, a, it's an anion, it's negative, so it has to go with a positive, like the sodium. Right? So just remember, positive and a negative need to go together. Um, calcium imbalance, another one that is an imbalance because it, it binds to something else. So calcium in the blood is regulated by the parathyroid glands, which secrete parathyroid hormone. Now calcium is an important imbalance to know. Um, because it's associated with the th thyroid, parathyroid hormones. Uh, so uh, parathyroid hormone enhances calcium retention and phosphate excretion by the kidneys, promotes calcium absorption in the intestines and mobilizes calcium from the bones. And that all raises the calcium level. So hypocalcemia results from diarrhea inadequate dietary intake of calcium or vitamin D, multiple blood transfusions, and some diseases, hypoparathyroidism. 
the most prominent sign of hypocalcemia is neuromuscular irritability. So patients who have thyroid surgery, parathyroid surgery, they might go into a tetany or their uh, muscles get rigid and shake. Uh, so that's neuromuscular irritability. It can be uh, tingling, muscle twitches, severe cramping. So hypercalcemia is abnormally increased level of calcium in the serum. And uh, hyperthyroidism, high calcium or vitamin D intake, immobility that causes stores of calcium in the bones to enter the bloodstream. It is also a complication of certain types of cancer. Um, magnesium imbalance, lower than normal concentration of magnesium in the blood, decreased GI absorption or excessive GI loss from vomiting or diarrhea, uh, hypomagnesiumemia often is associated with hypocalcemia and hypokalemia, so that's calcium and potassium. A higher than normal concentration of magnesium in the bloodstream is known as hypermagnesemia. Uh, magnesium coated medications or IV solutions in patients with renal failure or preeclampsia. So maybe if you've ever worked in OB or maybe been in preeclampsia of pregnancy, the magnesium is high. So it can cause a lot of problems. All right, let's get down to acid-base balance, acid-base disturbances. So remember your electrolyte imbalances, um, important ones, hyperkalemia, not only nursing care, but also um, what happens to the body. Also, hypokalemia is important. I know it seems like a lot of information. It's going to take a while to really learn this and understand it. But potassium, as you can see, that's the only one up here on this slide that I wrote something about. Dysrhythmias. Because potassium, too much potassium is bad, bad and kidney patients have it, will have a high potassium, and diabetics can have a high potassium. Patients taking uh, potassium sparing, diuretics can have it. So it's a really good lab value to know and uh, be aware of. All right, acid-base imbalances. So first I'm gonna go through these imbalances and I'm gonna show you some pictures of uh, actually patients in that condition and what they exhibit. So here we go. Acid-base balance refers to homeostasis of the hydrogen ion concentration of the body fluids. So this is where the power of the hydrogen comes in. A solution containing a high number of hydrogen ions is an acid and a solution containing a low number of hydrogen ions is an alkaline or base. So this is under acid-base disturbances in your book on page 97. So let's look at that. So pH, the, the symbol used to indicate hydrogen ion concentrations is pH, the power of the hydrogen. It's on a scale of 1 to 14 with 1 to 6.9 being acidic and 7 being neutral and 7.1 to 14 being alkaline. So normal is 4.5 to 6.5. Anything below that is acidic and above that is alkalytic. 
So the hydrogen ion concentration in extracellular fluid is indicated by the pH of the blood. So it's 735745. You guys need to remember that number. That is a blood gas, usually, that will tell us what the pH is of the blood. And that's usually done in a hospital setting, not a long-term care facility. Um, but it's good to know. You have to know. 7.35 and below 7.35, acid. Above 7.5, alkaline. So uh, the normal acid-base balance is maintained by three primary complex mechanisms, buffers, respiratory, and renal. So this is where the kidneys and the lungs become important in acid-base balance. But when we were talking earlier about electrolyte imbalances, we talked about cardiac and renal, right? Kidneys and circulatory. I said cardiac renal, same things, right? Kidneys and circulatory are regulatory mechanisms for your acid, for your um, regulatory mechanisms. And then when we talk about acid base, it's kidneys and lungs because that's what helps balance and as you see it's respiratory acidosis and alkalosis and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis so uh, let's go on down where it says the lungs and kidneys are the next line of defense after the blood buffers for maintaining acid base balance the lungs are responsible for carbon dioxide so lungs have O2 and CO2, which is controlled by the rate and depth of respirations. Carbonic acid or CO2 in the alveolar capillaries breaks down into water and carbon dioxide, and that is eliminated through exhalation. Deep rapid breathing, this is important to know. We're going to talk about it again, but here it is in your book. Deep, rapid breathing eliminates excess carbon dioxide, thereby reducing extracellular fluid acidity. Shallow, slow respirations reduce the loss of carbon dioxide, increasing extracellular acidity. So if the pH of the blood becomes too high or too low, the respiratory center in the brain sends a signal to the lungs to increase or decrease respirations. Again, homeostasis. Your body's trying to keep it right, keep things good, keep you healthy. But sometimes diseases make it impossible. All right. And remember that the respiratory center in the brain sends signals to the lungs to increase or decrease respirations. Uh, bicarb is a major acid buffer. So bicarb is a neutralizer. It's a buffer in the blood and is reabsorbed and produced through the kidneys. So we're talking about a focused assessment of acid-base balance. So be sure you get a good history, find out their diseases. Do they have diabetes, which could be a form of acidosis, uh, Diabetic ketoacidosis is a problem. So diabetics can get into that situation. Uh, do a good physical exam, signs and symptoms of anxiety or distress. So the general appearance of a patient sometimes can tell you something's wrong. Uh, so now let's talk about respiratory acidosis. It occurs when the respiratory system fails to eliminate the appropriate amount of carbon dioxide to maintain normal acid-base balance. And if you'll notice at the top of the page is uh, of table 6.7, it's arterial blood gas values. Now, I'm not gonna go into that right now because 
that's really going to be a situation arterial blood gases are going to be done at the hospital or the ER. Um, you can learn that at another time, but you should know the pH for sure. 735745, anything below that, you're acidic, anything above that, alkalitic. All right, uh, so acute respiratory acidosis, I'm in the second uh, paragraph in the first column there. Acute respiratory acidosis is caused by respiratory disease like pneumonia, drug overdose, head injuries, chest wall injuries, obesity, asphyxiation, drowning, or acute respiratory failure. People with COPD have an elevated carbon dioxide level. Now, this gets into they can have a normal pH because that's compensation. I don't want to confuse you with compensated conditions. Um, it gets really hairy. So we're just let's just concentrate on the main um, ideas here. So respiratory acidosis. The care of the patient in respiratory acidosis. So, you know, there is an oxygen uh, cannula that measures CO2. And that's a really cool thing. It's used in the hospital when some patients are being sedated, maybe for a colonoscopy or something like that. So it can measure their O2 and their CO2. And that's awesome if a patient had something like that. Um, but they're, you know, expensive. So some facilities don't have them. But, um, so we want to know what their CO2 level is. Um, and that can be manifested by signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. Restlessness, anxiety, confusion, tachycardia. Monitor their O2 saturation. Notice the rate, depth, and rhythm of respirations. So we're talking respiratory acidosis, respiratory. So look at their lungs the way they're breathing, what they're breathing, how fast they're breathing, all the things about breathing, their rate and depth. Um, if you can find out their carbon dioxide level, that's great. But you can also know that if a patient has respiratory issues, they might be retaining CO2, especially if they exhibit this restlessness, confusion, tachycardia, hallucination kind of things. Uh, pneumonia uh, can can uh, prevent the patient from eliminating their CO2. So any lung problems. So what do you do? Well, encourage fluids to loosen secretions and keep mucous membranes moist. Position the head of the bed elevated to promote optimal gas exchange. Monitor confused patients. Um, assist them to the bathroom every two hours, especially if you're increasing their fluids. Okay, so that's acidosis. Now let's go to respiratory alkalosis. So respiratory alkalosis is marked by low pCO2 with the resultant rise in pH. So because their acid is low, their CO2 is low, they're going to be alkaline which means their pH is going to be elevated. Uh, the most common cause of respiratory alkalosis is hyperventilation. So sometimes people, when they're upset or nervous, they <laughs> breathe really fast. That can send them into a respiratory alkalosis. Hyperventilation is characterized by rapid or deep re respirations that cause excessive amounts of carbon dioxide to be eliminated through the lungs. So because they're getting rid of the acid, or carbon dioxide that makes them alkaline. One cause of hyperventilation <clears throat> leading to respiratory alkalosis is anxiety. All right, so let's go to treatment. Major goal of therapy is to treat underlying cause of condition. So sedation may be ordered for the anxious patient, but you gotta be careful about that because if they're having breathing issues, yeah, if they're breathing too fast, because they're nervous or anxious, slowing their breathing down will get rid of their alkalosis. But um, 
Just be careful about sedating a patient. Keep an eye on them. So nursing care, as I said, keep an eye on their respiratory status. All right, let's go. Oh, under interventions, it said breathing slowly into a paper bag raises the CO2 because the patient rebreathes exhaled carbon dioxide. We used to do that, but uh, that's not done too much anymore. Metabolic acidosis. So metabolic, that's their whole body, right? It's maintained by their lungs. It's balanced out by their lungs, but their whole body is affected. So their neuro status is really, really, really important to monitor because acidosis is not a good thing to have acid in your body, right? Um, body retains too many hydrogen ions or loses too many bicarb. Bicarb is your buffer, your neutralizer. With too much acid and too little base, the pH of the blood falls. Metabolic acidosis leads to hyperventilation because the lungs try to compensate by blowing off carbon dioxide and lowering the CO2 levels. So what are some causes of metabolic acidosis? Starvation, dehydration, diarrhea, shock, renal failure, diabetic ketoacidosis. Another thing is salicylates, aspirin. Aspirin can lead to metabolic acidosis. Acetosalicylic acid, that's ASA, aspirin. Uh, patients may experience changing levels of consciousness. Medical treatment uh, for metabolic acidosis is treatment of the underlying disorder. Sometimes they not, might need to be on a ventilator, mechanical ventilation, uh, especially if they're comatose. Other nursing care of the patient with metabolic acidosis, do a focused assessment. Focus on their, now this is important, focus on their vital signs, their breathing. Do they have small respirations, that, that fast respirations? Monitor their mental status, that's neuro also, and other neurologic status. Um, so emergency measures are usually uh, administered to restore acid-base balance, drugs, IV fluids, reassure and orient confused patients. So let's go to metabolic alkalosis now. That's a loss of hydrogen ions. Uh, could be related to prolonged nasogastric suctioning, excessive vomiting, diuretics, and alkal electrolyte disturbances. Uh, signs and symptoms, headache, irritability, lethargy, change in level of consciousness. That neurologic assessment is really important in acidosis and alkalosis, metabolic. Uh, nursing care, vital signs, daily weights, INO, their motor function and sensation, lab values, bicarb levels. Uh, put on your thinking cap. Recall a patient who either has or was at risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalances. You know you have the answers in your um, books for those. That would be in your student resources under in Elsevier. So it has answers to things like that. All right, guess what? We're done, but I'm gonna show you some more slides. So hang in there uh, just a few more minutes. So let me show you some pictures. So this is respiratory acidosis. So notice uh, retention of CO2 by the lungs. Patient says, I can't catch my breath. So they're gonna have hypoxia. They're retaining CO2, look at their lungs. They're retaining CO2, it's up and their pH is down. So it's acidosis. Uh, rapid shallow respirations, low blood pressure, skin mucosa pale to cyanotic, they might have a headache, they might be hyperkalemic, 
If they're hyperkalemic or that elevated potassium, they could have dysrhythmias. Uh, Neurowise, drowsiness, dizziness, or in disorientation, muscle weakness, hyperreflexia, respiratory dis depression, overdoses, intracranial pressure, that's ICP, intracranial pressure might be elevated. You wouldn't know that, um, except you might have some, look at their pupils and their pupils might be dilated. They might have a headache. So it would be cranial symptoms, neuro symptoms, airway obstruction, alveolar capillary diffusion, pneumonia, COPD, ARDS, and pulmonary emboli. Uh, ARDS is adult respiratory distress syndrome. So this picture you can find on the internet if you wanted to print that out for yourself or you could print it out from the slide. Here's respiratory alkalosis. Now let's look at the difference. Look at the lungs because we're respiratory. So the CO2 is low. So they're not acid, they're alkaline. Their pH is up, 7.45. Uh, they might have seizures deep rapid breathing, hyperventilation, tachycardia, hypokalemia, numbness or tingling of extremities, lethargy and confusion, lightheadedness, nausea and vomiting, metabolic acidosis, metabolic. So it's the body. Now look where it is. It's at the kidneys now. It went away from the lungs. That was respiratory. Now metabolic is the kidneys function. So the bicarb, which helps is the buffer that helps keep us neutral, is low. So they're acidic and their pH is low, acidic. Now symptoms, headache, low blood pressure, hyperkalemia, muscle twitching. Acidosis can lead to neurological problems. Warm flesh skin, look how red they look. Nausea, vomiting. They have low muscle tone and poor reflexes. Coo small respirations. You're gonna see that a lot of different places. You may see it on NCLEX. It's a compensatory hyperventilation. So compensatory means, um, you know, it's opposite. It's to compensate for their lack of breathing. So they're acidotic, so they want to blow off some of that carbon dioxide, which is acid. Because one thing you'll learn later is you can have a combination of the two. You can have metabolic with respiratory compensation. So um, Kussmaul respirations they might have. So learn about that. It's a good word. Uh, low hydrogen from renal failure, low bicarb, dehydration, liver failure. Uh, they're unable to eliminate bicarb. All right, let's go to the next picture. You can get this on the internet also, or you can print it out from this slide if you wanted to. Metabolic alkalosis, they're green. Why? Because look at the causes. Vomiting, GI functioning, diuretics, excessive bicarb. Um, they're restless, followed by lethargy, dysrhythmias, tachycardia. Look at their heart. They have, and look at their kidneys. So here, alkalosis, the pH is up in their kidneys, up bicarb, alkalosis. They confuse, they might have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors or muscle cramps, tingling of the fingers and toes, hypokalemia. These pictures are good, you know, for people who not only learn from the book and words, but want to see a picture. So visual learners, this is uh, good for you. If you've got to print it out, put it up on your wall, 
so that you, you've got everything you need right here, right? About alkalosis, rather than all the words in the book. So if you have to print it out and put it up on your wall so you don't forget it, do that. Maybe that will help you help it sink into your head. I'm just trying to say things to help you guys remember. All right, let's go. I think we have a question coming up. Which of the following is a true statement? Boy, we learned this like two hours ago. So 60 to 70% of the human body is composed of water. When the body does not maintain homeostasis, the cells can still work, function properly. Well, I'm just gonna let you read through these and see what you think. What do you think is the right answer? Because it's a true statement. This is important. True statement, extracellular fluid. So the answer is D. Extracellular fluid is mainly responsible. And I, I say again, this is important for transport of nutrients and waste throughout the body. Extracellular fluid is mainly responsible for the transport of nutrients and waste throughout the body. Okay, we have another question. What is the transfer of water and solutes through a membrane from an area of high pressure to low pressure? Filtration. Through a membrane from high pressure shower head to low pressure, it spreads out. Or you can think of the water jug, right? It's a lot of pressure of that water bottle, but you just get out a little bit of water in your cup. And it goes through a membrane. So the answer is B, filtration. This is also what your kidneys do. It's the perfect example of fil filtration. Filters out waste products. That's all. I'm done. Thank you for listening to me. See you in class.